Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the session on China's economic outlook. My name is Tian Wei. It's such an honor to be the moderator for a distinguished panel like this. I remember very clearly last year, I was sitting on this stage together with many of our friends on the stage as well to discuss China's economic reality. 360 days have already passed, and there are a lot of things happening in between. So today we are very happy to once again bring many of the distinguished panelists together to discuss the realities of the Chinese economy, 5% growth rate, headwinds as a result of a series of challenges, both uh, in the process of reform and opening up, uh, and also uh, as a result of environmental, the international environment. And meanwhile, what is the potential for China and the world together? With that, it's my great honor to introduce to you our distinguished panelists. Mr. Peng Sen, President of China Society of Economic Reform here in China. Good to see you, sir. <laughs> Ms. Apana Baradash, who is the Managing Director and Partner and Global Leader, Global Advantage Practice with the Boston Consulting Group. She's based in Singapore. Good to see you. Thank you. Dr. Jin Ke Yu, Professor of Economics with London School of Economics and Political Science. She's based in London. Good to see you. <laughs> Last but certainly not least, mm -hmm. Eswa Prasad, Professor with Cornell University, based in the US. So good to see you, Professor. So you can tell this is a very international panel that we are talking to. China, Singapore, US, uh, uh, UK, uh, London. So let's jump directly into the conversation. According to the speech given by the Chinese Premier at the opening plenary of uh, Summer Doubles, 5% GDP growth rate is guaranteed. Now I want to go to you, Mr. Peng, how that promise will be fulfilled. What do you think are the major building blocks that would eventually deliver us that growth and hopefully good quality growth? Okay. Uh, thank, you. Well, thank you very much, um, moderator. Thank you, Professor Paul. Well, in general terms, um, we've been through three years of the pandemic era and got back onto a growth track in 2023. Um, the Chinese economy is riding waves, but sailing forward in 2023. China's economy achieved 5.2% growth, so it resumed some of its speed and contributed about 30% to global growth in the first quarter of this year, growth was higher than expected, 5.3% annual. That was somewhat better than expectations. Now, looking at these figures, the impression that they give you is that there's some recovery of a higher growth rate. Now, the complete figures for the first half of this year are not out yet, but looking at April and May, investment and consumption have tailed off somewhat in China. On the other hand, exports and international trade generally have enjoyed a quite large boost. Now, trade has grown at 5.0% in April and May. In in May, it was 8.6%, so it's up three percentage points there. So in general terms, um, China's economy is on the upswing. Um, that's not to say it's without its problems. The 
process of recovery doesn't yet have very firm foundations, and that can be seen in the following. Overall demand in the Chinese economy is still insufficient. Now, expectations among the public are somewhat weak. Um, we have uh, numerous uncertainties, particularly uncertainties that we face internationally. Um, but in summary, I would say that you know, moving into the second quarter, the third quarter, and so on, with the support of the macroeconomic policies that have adopted, in particular, the moves towards new quality productivity, and in particular, next month, there'll be the third plenary, the third session of the 20th plenum of the party, which will be bringing more, more good news. Um, as China's growth stabilizes, this is good news for the world. Li Qiang, at the opening of this meeting announced this goal that it would grow by 5.0%, and I'm fully confident that China will achieve that. Mr. Jin, when it comes to headwinds, we see a series of debates about different factors of the Chinese economy, uh, for example, uh, on green economy. The latest is about the electronic vehicles, as we know, it's going on every day in the headlines of the news. Now, China has been looking at green transformation as one of the drivers for its potential of uh, economic growth. How do you see the latest uh, events uh, providing us more thoughts as to both the ways and the directions of green transformation contributing to future growth? Thank you. Um, first of all, let's face one important reality in the world. There is a fundamental structural change that is underway uh, that has to do with new technologies and that has to do with climate change. And China is spearheading that um, structural transformation by actually starting very early. You know, part of the success for EVs and solar panels is that they started much earlier than a lot of the Western economies did. But the really important point to notice is that this is all part of a global supply chain. Okay? China might be leading the way in EVs and batteries and solar panels, but they are all embedded in a global supply chain, and it's going to involve everybody. There's been some recent research that has shown in the last few decades China's rise because of the global supply chain has also pulled up the economic development of many of the neighboring developing countries. And it's gonna be the same with EVs and with the renewables actually involving more advanced economies. So to give you an example, I think this is a very important example to, to make note of, China is investing heavily in Europe directly, setting up plants and factories on batteries and EV platforms, and whether it's Poland or Spain setting up joint ventures with EV, taking advantage of China's technology now. The table has completely flipped um, to launch their own uh, EVs and EV platforms. So this is a collaboration. Again, it might be that China is heading the way. And by the way, when we talk about demand and capacity, mm -hmm. you know, one of the numbers we look at, 45 million EV vehicles needed by 2040 to keep us on track of the green transition. Um, trillions of dollars of investment that's needed. China's going to play a very essential role. Interesting. Yeah. Professor Prasad, another challenge people talk about, of course, geopolitics. That's the elephant in the room. So I have to throw that question since you're coming from the US, but I know you're not a spokesperson for any government. Um, having said that, though, um, people in the room have all figured out the realities about that most important bilateral relations, arguably speaking, right now, already. So what is that actually change over the next few months, including election season in the US, going to have on business communities understanding of this relationship and therefore their decision making process regarding the Chinese economy. Please, <laughs> Professor Prasad. So there is not so good news on that front, uh, Tianwei. Since we met here uh, in Tianjin uh, um, uh, a year ago, 
I think a new baseline has been set in the US-China relationship, a baseline that is going to be very difficult to go below in terms of improving the relationship. If anything, that baseline could lead to more hostilities, more tensions between the two countries. Now, certainly, the effects of the November presidential election in the US will be very important. But the question is, what is going to change? My sense is that we're not going to have a major change in the overall approach of the US towards China, but certainly the strategy, the tactics could be very different under a second Trump administration as opposed to a second Biden administration. Um, but the difficult reality that the two countries now face is the following. Once upon a time, the economic relationship between the two countries used to be seen as a positive sum game where both countries could yeah. gain from mutual trade and finance. The geopolitics, of course, is intrinsically a zero-sum game. But now even the economic relationship is seen as a zero or even negative-sum game. One of the reasons, of course, is that many of the industries that China is looking forward to in terms of developing um, for its own technological upgrading, in terms of its own move up the value-added chain that uh, Kayo referred to, those are precisely the industries, green technology, um, solar batteries, um, um, EVs, those are precisely the industries that the United States and perhaps even Europe are counting on for their own manufacturing revival. The other element, of course, is that many American businesses, many American investors now seem to have the impression that China is not quite as conducive a place as it used to be to do business, to sell into the market here, or to use it as part of their supply chains. So I think it is very important that you mention that China can play a very important role in the global supply chain still, and it's not just about the US and China. But I think the overall framework is certainly going to be one where these two countries are not going to have the very tight, direct relationship that they had before. Mm -hmm. um, a point that uh, um, Professor Jin made at a dinner yesterday is that it's not that the two countries are decoupling, but the coupling is now going through alternative channels uh, with China investing in production um, and other facilities in other parts of the world to export to the US. So I think the reality is that we are in a much more connected world. Right. But because of these tensions, that connection is going to take different forms. Mm -hmm. I've been having different conversations over the past two to three days here in Summer Davos. Um, I will go to the question a bit later, but this is important backdrop that I collected from our audience and participants. People have been repeatedly asking, can we be more imaginative about our world and solutions? Do we only look at the world through the entry point of geopolitics? Are there any other as important and probably even more important entry points than just the geopolitics. I think that's what the business community is also thinking about these days. So as a result, uh, uh, Pana, I go to you uh, on some of the important thinking business community are doing with your latest survey and also your uh, research about what exactly is the role of the Chinese economy today yes. with the world. No, that's a, that's that a sounds point. like a big subject. You know, yes, we can yes. discuss for 100 years, but <laughs> today, very relevant, please. Absolutely. No, I think it's a big subject, and it's something that we could talk about for hours. But let me try to distill it in a couple of minutes. Mm. Uh, the first point is that China is very important to the global economy, not just the global business community, but to the global economy. I mean, if you just look at the 5% growth that you know, we're very confident that we'll achieve this year, that 5% growth will already add more to the global GDP than India, Indonesia, Japan combined. So even a so-called slowed down growth of China is actually incredibly relevant for the global economy. In addition to that, what we, we uh, did a survey of Fortune 500 business leaders, CEOs, and first of all, of the Fortune 500, 140 are Chinese business leaders. That's an important point. Secondly, more than half of those business leaders said to us that they are bullish on China and they continue to be bullish on China. So I think this decoupling of the global business community to China, even though the headwinds are tougher, is not something that we expect from a practical perspective. Now, I'll just touch upon a couple of areas where China's dependency, the world's dependency rather on China, is very high. The first is supply chains. I think you touched upon that already. But what I would also say is that China's already more than a third of global gross production. It's still more than a third of global gross production. And it's an order of magnitude higher than what US contributes or what Japan contributes. 
So China's relevance to global production is important. Now, China plus one strategies have been very much in the media and discussions. The reality is, even if you China unpack, plus one, just for those who do not follow the news every day, of course. Is, is, of course, it's a supply chain. Some yes, people want to have another chain. option besides China. Yeah. Absolutely. So China plus one is, a, is essentially diversification of supply chains to provide alternative manufacturing locations in addition to China for global manufacturers. But when we analyzed at BCG what those supply chains actually look like, and you talked about dependencies in, in electric vehicles, Behind the China plus one, you still see China contribution to many of those value chains. So exports from ASEAN to the US are increasing, but in those exports, there's huge China business value add and China manufacturing value add. Same for exports from Mexico to the US. So China's role in global supply chains remains. And I, one last thing I will mention is China's role in the global south. The global south as a narrative is getting galvanized. And you know, you see that with the expansion of the BRIC membership, you've had South Africa join the BRICs, You've seen Malaysia and Thailand apply to join the BRICS. The BRICS is going to become a de facto subset of the Global South with a louder voice. And nations of the Global South are looking to Chinese products, Chinese technology, mm -hmm. Chinese partnerships. And that's not just true for ASEAN, but it's also true for Latin America, Africa, and the Middle East. So there's tremendous potential for the world, if you look at the Global South as well, uh, in connecting uh, closely to China and partnering with China. So I feel optimistic, despite the headwinds about the potential. Yeah. Are you saying this only because this uh, summer Davos is being held in China? No, I would say that all over the world. Oh, okay, I all would right. I say that in our publications as I just well. want to put it on the record. Yes. Yeah. yes. No, Having said that, though, let's go to another important factor, uh, high quality growth. That's, of course, uh, it's a buzzword in the Chinese policy. Uh, but behind these buzzwords, a lot of the trends that we mentioned in green transformation, uh, digitalization, and also in diversifying in the global approach. But Mr. Pang, uh, tell us your current observation of high quality growth. How is it likely to be resilient facing up to some of the latest challenges we already mentioned uh, along the way? In terms of high. A quality, a new uh, quality productivity, um, uh, be it in academia uh, or in economic uh, um, uh, arena. This is a, a buzzword, and uh, this is about uh, advanced uh, productivity. Uh, it is about innovation. And why do we call it uh, new uh, quality productivity? Because we need uh, a high quality growth in order to uh, to stimulate. Um, our development and our growth. And this is, is depends on, of course, on the transition, revolutionary uh, transformation uh, on the technological front. Um, and as for the uh, traditional uh, sectors, they need uh, upgrade and they need uh, a deep transformation, profound transformation. And, there is, and we need also relocation of resources and innovative, uh, in an innovative manner in order to um, get more a driving force. Um, and we need uh, to uh, create a foundation, a stable foundation for the future growth of Chinese economy. And also, uh, given uh, the uh, tensions um, on the geo uh, uh, political front um, and the digital revolution and generative AI and its emergence, uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, shocks and and challenges. So, um, uh, so, so China. Uh, is conducting a series of uh, important programs uh, in terms of, for instance, uh, the generative uh, AI um, and integrated um, um, in integrated um, uh, um, uh, electric electronic panels and a series of industries that needs uh, to be upgraded. And in, in terms of generative AI, uh, it requires the big data um, and um, and computing power. And there are also a series of program, important programs, for instance, a national network um, in terms of computing power uh, is to be established. And with this, all these actions and endeavors, uh, China aims uh, at uh, cultivating a series of new uh, sectors and also um, to prepare uh, for emergence of new sectors. 
and China also China is also using uh, this uh, uh, technology in order to empower um, uh, some traditional sectors, and, and we need this uh, to modernize China um, and to grow. In almost every discussion mm -hmm. about the Chinese economy and economic policy, there is always a question regarding what exactly is the role of the government, mm -hmm. whether it's government at central level or government at local level. Of course, their nature is very different. So Mr. Peng, if I could follow up, and I think this is a must-ask question mm -hmm. regarding that, what exactly is the role of the government? I see our other panelists already wearing the earpiece. They want to listen very attentively. Um, Mr. Peng, oh, okay. of course, you are coming in from a researcher's perspective. Please, uh, thank you. Uh, well, well, this is a, a question uh, of uh, a market-oriented uh, reform, or a new phase uh, of chi uh, China's reform. Uh, because, well, our uh, reform policy dates back to 45 years ago. Uh, but the essential question is to deal with the relation between relationship between government and market. Um, during the 18th plenum, um, uh, we decided uh, to put to give full play to the role of the market um, in terms of relocation um, of resources. Well, this is a central question. Um, of our uh, format of uh, development. If, if a government uh, plays that role, it's a, mar it's a planned economy. But if we will let a uh, market decide, uh, we will have a market economy. Um, and the market uh, is playing a more, uh, a big, an even more, uh, a more, a bigger role. And a government should decrease its intervention. But we have a a socialist economy uh, with uh, Chinese characteristics, and the government has its role to play. But uh, the government um, will play uh, its role in an efficient uh, manner, and in order to create a um, clean level uh, field, and um, and and in terms of uh, empl employment, um, the. Uh, the private sector um, has, has uh, represented uh, 80%. And in terms of uh, GDP, uh, it's represented uh, 60%. And 50% in terms of um, um, uh, tax revenue. And we have 180 million um, of uh, uh, businesses um, in uh, China. And they're private um, uh, SMEs uh, that have an extremely important role to play. And if um, they could um, compete uh, on equal footing uh, in the marketplace, and I think uh, the, we could expect a very good future for the Chinese economy. A few words about that. Uh. <laughs> Well, it, well, of course, uh, the foreign players, they also um, contribute in a significant uh, manner uh, to, the uh, to the Chinese economy. Uh, also, in the Chinese ex export, um, uh, the, Chinese, uh, the, for the foreign um, companies uh, ha have also a very important role to play. Um, and and um, we, uh, we, we should continue to decrease uh, the restrictions that have been in the past. Um, and in various uh, sectors, for instance, in healthcare, we should also ease uh, the restrictions uh, that existed in the past. And that's what we have been doing. And there are some positive, very positive signals. Um, we should put up uh, a list um, of access um, for foreign investors and foreign uh, businesses. Thank you very much. Before I go to Dr. Jin, I want you also to comment on the same question. In his speech a couple of uh, days ago, Premier Li Chang spoke about the need to deal with the symptoms as well as the root causes of the problems besetting the Chinese economy. And I think both of those are very important. The role of the government, I think, is crucial in all of this. And one of the difficult challenges the Chinese economy is facing right now is there is a sense 
that the government might not be as encouraging of the private sector as it might have been in the past. The actions that were taken in 2022 and 2023 that affected the tech sector, the health sector, the education sector, I think have left um, a mark. Now, the question is, what is the right role of the government? I think the government has a critical role to play. If you think about the financial system, for instance, the financial system is essential to allocate resources to the part of the economy that can generate more employment growth, that can generate more innovation and therefore productivity growth. Mm -hmm. And a lot of innovation, a lot of employment growth has to come from the private sector, from small and medium enterprises, from enterprises in the service sector and so on. But this does not necessarily mean that the government takes the role of allocating credit in the economy. What it needs to do is to create a market-based financial system that does a good job of allocating credit. Now, markets do make mistakes, uh, free financial markets do make mistakes, but the right way to think about it is to have effective regulation in place and to have the right incentives in place so that the financial sector does the right thing and then the mistakes when they happen um, can be rectified. Likewise, if you think about the government's role in terms of promoting innovation, it's really to make sure that the private enterprises feel encouraged to do this, they get what is needed in terms of credit, but also a supporting institutional framework in terms of better corporate governance standards, in terms of better auditing yeah. and accounting frameworks, in terms of better government and corporate transparency. So these are the elements in which the government needs to play a role. But I think the big issue is really for the government to provide a very clear policy framework, which I'm hoping we'll see in the third plenum, which not only sets out what the government's objectives are, and I think we know those already, but really to think about the path that the government has in mind in order to get the economy to that place. Right. I think, Professor Prasad, you are commenting on this question not as an American professor, but as a professor who have been watching China's economy very closely over the decades. So thank you for your input. But go to you, Dr. Jin. There are uh, right perceptions and wrong perceptions, let me just put it that way, about realities of the Chinese economy <coughs> and decision-making process, uh, and the list goes on. So how do you, on the one hand, uh, see people's debates about the role of the government, and also how do you see the competition going on within China, for example, between regions uh, on uh, economic policy and economic approaches? Please. Yes, if I can take this role of the state and perceptions from a slightly different angle, right? Let's look across the world. What, we're, what are we seeing? We are seeing a return of the state, a very strong bang. How is it inspired? You know, where is the inspiration coming from? I think it's coming from China's success in these emerging strategic new sectors. Look at the revival of industrial policies. By the way, in the data, it's the rich countries that do much heavier industrial policies. Not China, but the richer countries, and China was um, a, a, a kind of copying that, that, that route. But there's a return of that. Hundreds of billion dollars, CHIPS and Science Act, uh, you know, a green industrial deal, green new deal in Europe, Japan, aiming to revive its semiconductors industry through hundreds of billions of dollars investment in high tech. UK talking about the digital economy and infrastructure and so forth, and a return of the state. So if the model is so bad and so wrong, why is everybody copying that, that model with the role of the state? But here, let me be clear. We cannot narrowly interpret industrial policy, and coming back to your perception issue, as a mere subsidies, as merely financial subsidies. <laughs> some subsidy has worked in China, some others have worked less well. But what we do know is that the softer policies in that realm matter equally as much. For instance, like infrastructure. EV demand policy subsidies didn't work effectively until the EV charging stations are put in place. That's actually now a big uh, infrastructure investment you know, talks in Europe and in the US. Similarly, coordination of supply chain, talent, coming back to the financial system. All of that is really important. Um, but one really fundamental aspect of the state involvement is does it actually ultimately promote competition? Mm. That we have seen repeatedly through the studies is that if industrial policies ultimately encourage competition, then by and large, they could have a very positive impact. Mm. Very interesting a discussion. I know, Apana, you want to participate. Thank you, sir. Well, uh, I'm not an expert on government policy in China, <laughs> but I can speak to it from how business leaders uh, think about this, right? I do think that um, 
from a, from a world to China perspective, there are opportunities for Chinese businesses still to be able to find growth all around the world. And I think, yes, uh, government policy has something to do with it. For example, the RCEP, which is the largest FTA in the world, uh, finds ways by which China can work closely with many of the nations, almost all the nations of Asia Pacific. And that opens up opportunities. So this kind of international uh, trade deals can be a great conduit. The other thing that we are seeing is we're seeing more digital framework agreements and digital deals that are coming that are dominantly digital in, in nature. Not a trade deal with a digital component, but dominantly digital in, nation, in nature. ASEAN starting that first one, which hopefully gets signed in 2025. There are opportunities also to, for China to take a lead in the world stage to craft and to participate in those digital uh, partnerships. Mm -hmm. The third thing I would say is I think Chinese businesses uh, coming more to my area of expertise, which is working with businesses, Chinese businesses can really find avenues for growth all over the world. Um, one area, for example, is AI. You know, um, uh, uh, We see that you know, around Asia, all over Asia, our research shows that there's far more acceptance and openness to, for consumers uh, to adopt AI-based solutions. Now, if you look at the same data in some of the Western markets, particularly Europe, Australia, et cetera, uh, there is a net negative sentiment towards AI. Mm -hmm. So really benefiting from the net positive sentiment of the Asian consumers when it comes to AI applications would be another area of opportunity uh, for Chinese businesses. Uh, now today, Ch Chinese LLM models are not at the same quality as, uh, frankly, the American LLM Correct. models, but the gap is closing, and there are opportunities in the future. I do want to touch on two points that both all of you almost raised or indicated. One is how the Chinese business community are digesting the realities. And as a result, their newest approach to whether you call it going overseas or going global and what it might be its impact on both Chinese policymakers and also, of course, China's economic growth. Uh, Dr. Jin, go to you on that. Many of those sitting here in the audience, they have their companies operating in so many different parts of the world. It has already become almost the latest norm for companies, whether you call it Chinese companies or companies born in China, you name it. How do you see this latest approach is actually impacting on the mentality of policymakers and also the possible growth potential of this economy? Well, I, I certainly think that that is the next chapter, right? We're embarking on Chinese companies going global. Remember, I think, uh, 20 years ago, there was another earlier campaign of Chinese company going global. That, but that was very different. Very different. different. Yes, Traditional indeed. Traditional industries. And you know, speaking about that, I find it highly ironic that despite the geopolitical tensions in US China, I think still four out of the five of the most downloaded apps in the US today are Chinese apps, um, so that's one thing to take into account. It's a, it's a new model, it, you know, Chinese traditional industries, uh, manufacturing, all of that was kind of the old playbook, right? But Chinese new innovative business models, the digital economy, by the way, which is 40% of GDP as opposed to only 10% in the US, um, but even coming you know, back to India, right? China, the new comparative advantage in this new digital age has changed. It's not just oil, but it's data and it's algorithm, it's compute and all of that. So, that is all, all changing. So I think there are real opportunities here because yes, Chinese business might have, in certain sectors, have some headwinds, geopolitically speaking, in the Western countries. There's still a lot of opportunities because Chinese technologies, the new crop of Chinese technologies are practical. Mm -hmm. They could be tailor-made, could be implemented very fast. They are um, cost-effective and they could really be the cost-effective solution to many of the developing countries present uh, problems. So the question is how to grasp that opportunities, but of course there's still lots of cultural barriers. But as we're seeing, you know, e even against this whole geopolitical backdrop, we're seeing many, many more trade agreements being signed all mm -hmm. over the world, a lot more regionalization, a lot more, you know, trying to grasp the opportunities by Middle Eastern GCC countries or Southeast Asian economies. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing a huge amount of dynamism in, I don't want to call it the global south, but you know, ex-Western advanced economy. So I think Chinese companies have a lot of role to play there. Mm. By the way, um, I was having a conversation of one hour with uh, innovators coming from China right before this uh, big uh, plenary session. And uh, 
many of them actually got me intoxicated by their dynamism, despite of all the headwinds that we have mentioned already in the world, that they are telling me they're focused on the, the, the problems, the problems that the consumers have. As long as they address that, their uh, work will be recognized. I think that's a very interesting uh, perspective coming from some of the entrepreneurs since we do not have uh, many entrepreneurs on the stage today. But uh, Mr. Pong, go to you um, on that. How do you see the landscape change internationally and now Chinese commun business community's approach uh, to deal with it? Okay. Mm. 这个 well, I think our key focus still has to be China's growth and China's relations with the, including bilateral, with the rest of the world. <laughs> but let me just say a couple of things on the rather complex international environment that China has to deal with. I mean, you've been talking about value chains, artificial intelligence. Um, all of this is really an extension of China's own development, but what environment is that taking place in? There are changes unparalleled for a century or so in terms of politics and secu security, and especially geopolitics. And what's happened in geopolitics has been a serious stressor for the world. Now, it's very possible that the Russia-Ukraine war becomes an unending war, like in Kashmir. Um, it's very hard to predict the results of the Israel-Palestine conflict, and there's a conflict going on in the Red Sea, and it involves energy and the transport of goods, so that has large potential impacts for global trade, but these aren't the most important issues. I and mean, the big problem is the trend of deglobalization or anti-globalization. There's a new wave of unilateralism and protectionism. In terms of discussion, but also what's being done in terms of policy. And that is a serious source of stress for the stability of China's growth. Now, there's been mention just now of US actions against China's industries where China has an advantage and they've been trying to limit or constrain China's exports. I mean, there's 100% duties being imposed on China's EVs by the US. Semiconductors, that's gone up to 50%. Raw materials, 25%. The European Union, for its part, is a very big part of the world economy. And this was an ex officio investigation by the authorities. There wasn't an application by the local industry, but they carried out an anti-subsidy investigation against Chinese EVs, and they're threatening in July to raise duties to 20 or 30-something percent. These will have a major impact on the Chinese economy. So as we look at internationalization by Chinese businesses, you have to take these factors into account. And China definitely doesn't look to engage in a trade war. The key, the key is whether or not this can actually be dealt with by negotiations, and consultations, and under the WTO framework. Um, if that doesn't work, then China doesn't want to see a trade war, but is not afraid of one. New industries, in particular industries where China has an advantage, have to be ones where China does continue to industrialize. Sometimes you have to have longer value chains. Um, there's less imports into the US directly from China, but there's some production taking place by Chinese companies in 
elsewhere in the Americas and Southeast Asia and so on. So the total coming in has not changed. The U.S. has ostensibly been looking to protect its industry and consumers, but it's actually been damaging the world value chain and has also been increasing costs, which are ultimately borne by the U.S. consumer. That is bad news for globalization. Well, that's how the logic is. I have a strong belief that there are two forces. One is business dynamism and entrepreneurship, especially in our countries like China and India, and globalization. There are forces that are very difficult to stop because they have enormous benefits. There is one force, however, that can put significant roadblocks in their way, and those are governments. Governments responding, in their view, to domestic interests as well as their geopolitical views. And that, I think, is what we are seeing right now. In many countries, what we are seeing is that globalization's benefits have not necessarily gone to the masses. They've gone to the political and economic elite. I think forces like digitization that Kayu referred to are very important in making everybody in an economy feel that they have a vested interest in the success of that economy, mm -hmm. vested interest in reforms, because they're all going to benefit from those. So what the governments need to do really is to make sure that they have the right kind of environment in place so that there can be more participation in the benefits of globalization. Likewise, if you think about governments putting hindrances in the way of broader forces of globalization, again, they're responding to domestic forces. And I think it's incumbent on governments, first of all, to make sure that they're helping in terms of building up and sustaining the international economic order, um, the rules-based system, which China um, has indeed tried to maintain, but I think it's very important uh, for it to convince the rest of the world that it is taking that seriously in terms of giving American companies, Western companies, more broadly access to its markets and will play by the rules of the game. So I yeah. think these elements can really help in terms of changing the nature of the dialogue and unleashing these forces, which I think ultimately can create a lot of good for these economies, help them reorient their own growth models and benefit the world at large. Thank you. Apana, do you have anything to add, very briefly? Um, yes, maybe I can touch upon it from a business lens once again, and thinking of what is it that multinationals can do in, in the Chinese market, you know, touching upon your last point. And essentially, I think multinationals need to, uh, in, in, that operate in China continue to value the China market, right? There are areas like automotive, medtech, um, et cetera, where China is a very important part of that business. The question will be, very briefly, a combination of innovation a combination of finding lower cost solutions and to be able to find local for local solutions. And I think that combination is probably the one. But yes, it has to happen in an environment of open competition. It has to happen in an environment of multinationals getting access uh, mm -hmm. uh, to that. Right. Briefly respond and before we go to the questions. Calling us back to the Chinese domestic economy mm -hmm. here for one second. Look, you know, China is in transition, right? When we talk about these investments and strategies of high tech and newer sources of growth, these are the right things to do. But at the same time, we have to be very realistic about what that means in the short term and immediate term, immediate run, right? Huge investment in technology. The fruits of that is gonna take time, just as we've seen with the AI revolution. You know, the real estate, to be offsetting the real estate investment with newer investment, well, real estate really provided a, a huge amount of growth and uh, employment. So realistically, you still have to do many other things apart from high tech. For instance, service sector, again, only accounting for 47% of employment, 50% of growth, uh, GDP. If you open that up, many young people, highly educated, can be absorbed. You can create a lot of opportunities, more social protection, and more um, <coughs> flows of talent, people across the regions, yeah. reducing interregional trade. So we got to look at the challenges, but opportunities as well, but also be realistic of what all this means. Mm, wonderful. So let's open it up to the floor. I know I'm only asking some very preliminary questions. There are much smarter ones coming from our audience. There are practitioners. Their insights uh, is very valuable. Let's have our microphones ready. Yes, thank you so much. We got hands already in the front line. And do show uh, us uh, your hand if you want to ask a question. And plus, another speech, please. Uh, just uh, who you are and the question and your insights. Uh, my name is Kevin Tu. I'm from Agora Energy Transition China. Uh, my question is addressed to Professor Jin Keyu and Professor Process. 
So against the backdrop of rising geopolitical tension between United States and China, in case there is a second Trump presidency, what's the implications for European Union's China policy, especially EU's de-risking of supply chain strategy? Thank you. Sounds like we are in a situation room now. Thank you very much. I, shall I collect a few questions and then we'll let everybody to answer so that would be more question uh, can be asked. Uh, that's one about the US election and the EU China. Uh, let's go to that area and then we can maybe go to the other areas. That area, maybe a lady to ask the question first. Yeah. Um, I have a question for uh, Mr. Uh, Peng. Um, so what are your, what are your expectations uh, to the third plenum? Uh, expectations of the plenary, uh, okay. Uh, uh, Mr. Peng, I wonder you could answer that question in one minute. Uh, uh, do we have anyone raise our hands from there? If not, we move to the other area. Any other questions? Wow, this is a very satisfied audience that we have today. Uh, so, okay, so let's go to the geopolitics uh, impact uh, US-China on China-Europe, right? That's the question. Okay, the two professors, please. Briefly, everyone has less than a minute. If you can handle that very global issue, please. <laughs> so the reality is that um, under the Trump administration, um, the objectives in terms of, uh, um, you know, the approach towards China are probably not going to be that different, but the um, precise elements of the strategy, the tactics might be quite different. You might have much more histrionics, you might have tariffs rather than the sort of measures the Biden administration has taken. But um, there is an important question about what role um, Europe will play in this. So the Biden administration has been much more effective at uh, gathering together like-minded countries from the West in terms of their China policy. I think with uh, Trump administration, we are likely to see much more fragmentation. Trump will do whatever he does, uh, um, and he will not uh, care that much about Europe. What Europe's response to that will be uh, will be interesting, because it is possible that if uh, Trump puts up even higher uh, fences in the form of uh, tariffs and restricts technology even more than a Biden administration might do, um, China might try um, to develop uh, um, a less hostile relationship between uh, with the Europe. But Europe, I think, feels as threatened as America does right now because many of its uh, ambitions of moving up um, towards higher tech industries, the new technology industries, are also seen as being threatened by China. So I don't think there is going to be a huge difference, but certainly Europe and uh, the US will probably move together much more closely in a Bi uh, Biden administration. In a Trump administration, it will be more fragmented. Mm -hmm. uh, Professor Jin? Very briefly, um, I just want to echo the brilliant remarks from the U.S.-China panel in answering your question about the outcome of elections, which is it's a country, U.S., with allies and without allies. And neither president is good for China, but neither president can candidate is good for the U.S. either. And um, th that was by my panel uh, colleagues uh, from the last panel. But if Trump comes in and um, has imposed a 10% tariff, as he said, on everybody, right? Imagine the fact that there will be a certain reduction in potential GDP growth globally. Don't forget about Brexit and its permanent impact uh, on the UK. Mm. Abhana, what about for the others, since you're based in Southeast Asia? Yes. No, I think, uh, so it's a couple of things. One. Um, from a U.S. election standpoint, uh, the U.S.-China relationship is the only bilateral question. It's a question on which Democrats and Republicans directionally are similar, even though, of course, uh, the policies and the execution, as you rightly said, might be different. So uh, one thing that I think working in with markets in the global south and the rest of the world we've come to realize is this is not a temporary situation. This is something you have to plan for for the next decade or two. And that's how business leaders across the global south are thinking of it. You can't wait this out, you have to plan for it. Now with that in mind, most of the markets of the, of, most of the, markets of the global south and business leaders in the global south would like to do business across geopolitical boundaries. They'd like to do business with all the major global economies of the world. And what they are starting to do and what we are seeing now is that what used to be a WTO overall regime is now becoming a tapestry of regional and multi-regional agreements where each set of countries are finding another set of countries that they can work with. 
It's a more complicated tapestry, but it is still pro-business when it comes to countries of the global south. Governments are trying to do pro-pro-business business moves that allow them to do business with the world. So I do think that does offer opportunities, but it's not as simple as saying, if I'm WTO compliant, all is well, or oh, it's a two-polar two world. It's not that simple. It's actually a multipolar situation with a tapestry of combinations that as business leaders, we will need to understand and navigate in order to thrive. And that will continue for some time before all the dust has settled down, probably even beyond the November, of course. Um, Mr. Peng, no. now that big question, what about the third plenary? Um, I know you are uh, not uh, giving a, an official prediction here, but rather as a reformer, how do you come in and see the potential, please? Well, currently, um, which um, um, the Chinese public um, um, is um, uh, waiting for uh, is this uh, uh, important session, the third plenum. Um, and uh, one of the greatest um, uh, questions it has to do, um, um, has to discuss, is um, to, to make discussions, uh, uh, is to make decisions uh, for uh, the um, um, uh, develop uh, going forward. Uh, the key word is high quality development um, and new quality uh, productivity, and the goal is modernization. Uh, genuine modernization uh, of, the, of the country. Um, so, uh, be it, um, the, the current challenges um, or um, uh, or uh, the questions uh, um, uh, regarding uh, a future, I think the third plenum will have a very much important role uh, to play because we have a lot of problems, a lot of challenges, um, and um, we'll have a, 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 a problem-oriented uh, reform. Uh, the reform will help us uh, find solutions and uh, uh, to stimulate uh, our growth. And we, we need to be very much uh, clear about uh, the uh, direction, the orientation of our reform. We, uh, we have been reforming since 45 years. Um, so we, we, um, uh, we want to have more openness and a more market-oriented uh, um, uh, economy. Um, and uh, we will let uh, the uh, market entity uh, uh, play uh, a bigger role, and we have to, to give them uh, more, uh, 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 more, uh, 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 better uh, policies uh, in order to uh, enable them uh, to, to, to grow. Um, and we have also uh, been talking about uh, the uh, big market, uh, internal uh, big market, uh, the concept of uh, internal uh, big market. Um, and, and this uh, would um, uh, do away um, of um, uh, some uh, restrictions on the local level. Uh, this is often also a very important uh, issue. And uh, there should also be uh, a reform uh, about land, uh, about technology, about labor, uh, about um, uh, uh, data as a, a, a factor of production. We should give the full play to the market uh, who, is, uh, who decides uh, in terms of pricing. Um, and uh, ultimately, our reforms will also, uh, will also um, uh, improve uh, some mechanisms, for instance, in terms of uh, uh, intellectual property, uh, in terms of investigation, um, uh, in terms of competition. This is also very important and could be uh, conducive uh, to our future uh, development. Um, and hope, I hope uh, the third plenum will be uh, a complete success. Thank you very much. We're looking forward to it in the month of July. We only, according to the official clock, uh, uh, one minute left. So as a moderator, I need to solicit all the best takeaways from today's discussion. And by the way, this is a, a joint production between the World Economic Forum and the CGTN. And I want to thank everyone participating in this discussion. Before we go, we talk about China's economic outlook. Mr. Peng said, let's come back to the topic. How do you see and how would you describe using one word or two about this outlook? Uh, well, I think um, as far as the Chinese economy, there's a lot of hope. But there are a lot of difficulties as well. But thanks to reform and market-oriented reforms, will be prepared for a sustainable and healthy uh, development. We will lay the groundwork. Thank you. I just say make sure we keep China open for business and make sure we keep the world open for China. Thank you.
Professor Prasad. So decent short-term prospects, and as for the longer term, good prospects if the government does the right thing. Apanna, last but not least. Thank you. All business leaders, no matter what industry, no matter what specialization, need to develop a geopolitical muscle to be able to thrive in the more complicated world. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen, for your input and insight. You know, whoever is doing this discussion has a lot of courage because the world is taking so fast the changes. Uh, as a result, let's come back maybe in a year or two to also discuss the same question. Once again, thank you so much. Appreciate it. And thank everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.